Willkommen, Lars. Sí, ciao. ¿Cómo estás? Bien. ¿Tú estás bien? Sí, estoy bien. ¿Se ve el, la presentación? Se ve la presentación perfectamente. Okay. Aspettiamo altri tre minuti se per te va bene. Sì, sì, va bene, certo. Grazie. nel 2018 insieme a Marianne Birtel, Birtler e eh, ha vinto anche il concorso per, il, per realizzare il padiglione tedesco a Dubai per Expo 2020. Vi invito, 2000, sì, 2020. Vi invito a visitare il sito www.graftlab.com per eh, scoprire di più. Eh, oltre all'attività professionale, Lars Krukeberg è stato visiting professor presso la Hafen City University di Amburgo, la RWTH di Aachen, l'Università Tecnica di Delft e soprattutto presso Roma 3, 
Infatti lo scorso anno il professor Krugerberg è stato titolare del laboratorio Learning from Abroad e ogni anno il nostro dipartimento attiva invitando dei progettisti esterni. Bene, io credo di aver rubato anche già troppo tempo al nostro ospite e quindi gli cedo con piacere la parola e lo ringrazio ancora per, per la partecipazione. Allora, grazie tanto Adolfo, grazie tanto a uh, Roma 3 di, di avermi. Scusate se, se non faccio questa lezione in italiano perché spero che <ride> sarebbe troppo ridicolo il mio italiano non è. Perfetto, non è così bravo come pensa Adolfo, così veramente scusate se lo faccio in inglese, altrimenti non, ho, non posso farlo in tempo, non posso farlo con um, una intelligenza che si, si deve avere uh, su questi temi che sono importanti. Ok, um, I switch to English, uh, please forgive me, but it will be easier. Um, you see a couple of C words, curiosity, craft, courage, change and corona and you will find all of these um, topics uh, within this lecture i think um, as in a way everything today is to be seen through the filter or the glasses maybe binoculars uh, or microscope of uh, the corona crisis um, yeah i'm sitting in berlin right now uh, i wish i would be in rome i actually was planning to be in rome Uh, these days, but uh, the crisis made it impossible. Um, so I'm, I'm in Rome a little bit uh, through the digital means, uh, which is not bad. Let's dive right through it. The first slides I can go through a little bit more quickly. As um, Adolfo already mentioned, uh, yes, we started in Los Angeles and then opened an office in 2001 in Berlin and 2004 in, in China. Um, we started in China, in Beijing, now we actually switched to um, Shanghai and um, it gave us the possibility to look into cultures where we engaged with, because we really think it, it might sound uh, normal, but it, it's truly the way that if you want to, um, you know, think, you have to think globally, but you have to act locally, you have to know Uh, uh, what you're doing and where. So we, we try to be close to our projects. Uh, LA was, uh, was a great thing. Um, it had a lot of freedom for us. We couldn't have started the office in Berlin as we started in LA. Um, yes, and uh, having the ocean there and the mountains and the desert, it helps. LA is not really a city, but it is um, something that, that connects these natural forces. Uh, and you understand how to create narrative spaces in Hollywood in, in Las Vegas. Um, Beijing was very interesting for us because you had so many opportunities, uh, yet it was really tough to work there and still is. Um, a decade ago, we, when we were there, the, the SARS epidemic started in China, luckily back then, and never really made it uh, to other countries. But we knew what could happen, meaning we learned from it in, in this crisis. And I'll talk about this in a moment. This was our first office in Beijing, in old Utong. And then Berlin, where we are right now, this is kind of the headquarters these days. Um, of course, is a city with great potential as after the war fell, especially Berlin with all the potential of free space was amazing to us. That's why when we had a chance, we also uh, opened an office here And the biennial that Adolfo was referring to was exactly about this, the empty space that was created uh, where there was a death space before, which still is, I think, the, the main thing about Berlin, this idea of freedom that you still can find. And that is, uh, at least for my mind, as, as a young German, when the war opened, it was, it was crazy, actually. The, the, the word of the year back then was crazy. Uh, and it was, and it was good crazy. A lot have changed till then. Um, now we have, just in Berlin, these are all the offices we have in Berlin. This is the Graft Office Archipelago. So every single dot there is a grafty working from home. So all of these little dots are offices. One of them, uh, somewhere here, this is Prenzlauer Berg. So you see a lot of people are in Prenzlauer Berg or Mitte or in Kreuzberg. Um, I'm one of these dots somewhere in here. Um, but yeah, this is what happened. 
we we prepared it um, before it even became really um, a kind of a lockdown. It's not as hard as a lockdown here in Germany as it is in Spain or uh, in Italy. Um, but yes, we had home office. We asked everybody. Everybody was happy with it. Uh, so we were prepared because we knew through SARS what could happen. And since six weeks, we all work from home and it works really well. Um, and that is something, this kind of freedom of changing space, of shifting from living to working, something we, we're going to talk about in this lecture a little bit. Um, we see with optimism what can be learned from this crisis. Um, and we're already learning right now. So yes, these are all our little offices um, right now. When I talk about curiosity, craft, courage, change under the umbrella or the, the filter through Corona, we have to talk about change. And I'm going to dwell a little bit in the beginning on that. We're going to see the um, emerging hybrid spaces. We are in the moment where borders are dissolving, not the borders of our countries. Unfortunately, they're hardened again, which is a shame. Um, Maybe I have to say something in the end about being German and what Europe means right now, and especially the relationship between Germany and Italy. I'm not happy about my government, uh, I must say. Europe and Germany needs Europe. Anyway, um, not happy about it, as many Germans are not happy, and you should know that. Um, and then the third thing, data architecture. So what have we learned and where can we apply it? Let's dive right through into, uh, into it. With Corona, there is a lot of change. This change is not new though. It's just uh, something that is accelerating right now, um, just you know, within days, within weeks. Um, I think Corona you know, keeps reminding us uh, what our relationship with nature really is. It's changing. It's changing rapidly and has changed before. Um, the idea of nature or landscape as something to study is not that old. Maybe it was different in Greek and Roman times, but basically only the Renaissance started again to see nature as the opposite of culture. So you see the first uh, uh, paintings about nature emerging in the early 40, uh, 15th century. This is uh, Botticelli. There are a couple of earlier examples, but you get the gist. The idea of nature as something different from us that we study, that we long for, that completes us is quite interesting. Um, throughout time, uh, nature became, you know, um, the idea sometimes of mankind of nature. Not necessarily, you know, it's like it's it's the opposite or it's even dangerous. Yes, that too. In Japanese culture, you see it brilliantly. The Japanese kare sansui, the dry rock gardens, are this this painted or, or 3D um, perfect scenarios of nature that man had. Um, as, as an ideal scenario. Um, nature is part of architecture and became more and more. Of course, you know that image. Uh, usually I have to write down what it actually is for anybody, but you know, you guys in Rome know perfectly where it is. So the idea of dynamic forms of something um, that is kind of natural or can be viewed in natural geometry, um, if it's the golden section, um, this dynamic um, blended into architecture um, after Renaissance going into the Baroque. And of course, Borromini was its high priest of, um, let's say, sacred geometry, um, for the lack of a better word. Um, and even today, you know, in modernism, the Art Nouveau scene that, that used natural forces, but in a very modern way. Today, we look back at, um, for example, the, uh, the design for the metro in Paris, um, Hector Guimard um, and, and, and the likes. Back then, it was highly controversial and very, very modern, but deriving its form from nature and its um, essential purity. This is not just romanticism. This is actually quite modern and radical. Um, in a way, we see ourselves and our work in that tradition. This is um, a work that we've done here in Berlin at a lake. It's a, it's a villa. It's a very big villa. It's actually a high performance villa, meaning uh, most of its energy it's uh, creating with uh, solar, thermal and photovoltaic, uh, as well as geothermal sources. And it's basically dug into the nature. It, it, kind of, it kind of goes out of the nature from the north. So it's protected and it's opening up on three levels then onto the lake. So the, the connection between 
culture, nature, let's say the artifact, the man-made thing and the landscape is something we're really interested in because we believe that if you follow formal gestures, you, you can be very suggestive in guiding people naturally through a building on, on suggesting where there should be, where you know you feel comfortable, where you actually host it um, by, um, by form. Something that you can uh, learn from nature and, and use it. So within this idea of culture versus nature, we believe we basically in, in the last century, especially now in this century, we crossed a line where there are so many people on the earth, we're affecting earth in a way that there is no distinction anymore between nature and culture. We're um, over 9 billion people in 2050, maybe before, and these people are forming their surrounding and environment constantly by all means. Um, we all know also that most of these people flock to cities. Our cities are growing. Europe, in a way, is uh, not that affected, but if you look at uh, Middle and Southern America or to Asia, you see a kind of urbanization that is beyond what we can think in our European cities. And we have to deal with it because it's eating up what we call landscape or nature and becomes part of it. So to say it, we live in times of the Anthropocene, meaning there is not really any nature left that is untouched by, by the human hand or our footprint. We even landed on the moon. And I think um, that's not just the stupidness of Mr. Trump, but Mr. Trump wants to harvest the moon as much as he wants to buy Greenland. It's just exploitation. It is um, the way we deal with this earth. And we think we have to come to balance with it again. So in a way, the crisis through a virus that originated somewhere um, in, in, the, in the bodies of wild animals, probably, most probably, in China, it's not a surprising thing that it comes um, really close to civilization, hence becomes part of our lives and we have to deal with it. Um, this already happened with the Spanish flu. This, this happened with the swine pest not that long ago. And it's not a matter of country. It's not just the animal farms and, and um, um, markets in China. This could happen in Italy uh, with, with, uh, with pigs or in Germany or, or uh, actually it already did happen in America. Um, it's just part of what the world is uh, becoming to and we have to deal with it. Now we can deal with it in a responsible way or we can basically waste it. Um, so we're already aware of this. I'm not telling you anything new here. Um, what's new maybe is how we architects react to this. And Graph became part of, um, of a movement that is basically Fridays for Future, but for architects that in, originated in England, now is also in Germany. The coronavirus kind of stopped um, this initiative from spreading, basically saying it's like we have to, as architects, we are the ones that destroy things in order to create others. Now, the way we do this, this responsibility we have, we have to deal with it. And we can do it in a better way. We have to do it in a better way. Um, there are moments which maybe are a little bit picturesque, but they go in the right direction. And it's images like this. I, I you know, the, the climate balance of this tower, you could debate maybe, but the image that we created with the Bosco Verticale is uh, powerful, is very powerful. And it sent a message, I think, to many, many people. Um, it, a little bit, it's for me, it's a little bit too literal, the connection of nature and culture, but it goes definitely in the right direction. And we have to think in this way. We have to think in the way uh, we basically grow our food. And as I said, if we live in the Anthropocene, there's not just the land providing the city. We have to provide for ourselves within the cities. And we can. This was actually a trip by, by the Berlin Senate. And they invited us to come along and show them a little bit around us. We know America quite well. Um, but these things are happening um, as well in Berlin and uh, in Rome, of course. And this is where we have to go. Now, another huge um, potential is basically what we are doing right now. We have an lecture um, through digital means. I don't have to be where you are. You don't even have to be in the same room. Uh, and that's in interesting. Um, how do we deal with people that are older than us, uh, or let's say older than me, 
um, because I'm right on this brink, right? I did my diploma in, in uh, Braunschweig in Germany, drawing by hand, and I did my, my thesis, my master in America um, with a computer. So I, I basically are exactly on this digital divide. We cannot lose the old people though, in this uh, digitization that uh, we, we should embrace in my point of view, because it gives us enormous flexibility. Um, but yeah, the future is digital and people that are native with that will use the computer in a different way to come forward um, with new solutions. Data architecture, we talk about that a little bit later. So the new, the new paradigm of the Anthropocene and digitization, I think, are the strongest forces that we're facing right now, and we should use them. Um, we have a global network now. Uh, of course, that takes a lot of energy, yet it gives possibility of science, making decisions based on science um, against uh, the populist powers that are um, on the march. And I, for once, think and hope that the crisis is helping to um, basically to single them out and saying, it's like, no, you're not right. You cannot twist the truth. If you do, there will be death, basically. And we see it uh, basically in the governments that reacted too late, um, but then trying to, to do the right thing. I think you see in England and America what happens if you ignore things um, and are more interested in populist votes, Brexits and building walls. Um, I think that uh, Italy reacted too late, but then it did react and it is a struggle. It is a fight. It's not easy. Um, but what helps is being together uh, and we can be together with digital means. What happens is we see the emergent of third places. I think we have to question the idea, the modernist idea of function. You know, form follows function is not accurate anymore maybe, um, because functions become much more complex. In times where we're all at home working, um, and we can, what does home really, is that, is that home then, or is that the office? And what if you go the other way around? Maybe our offices can start to be homes. Um, these third places where functions are overlapped are the future, I think, and there are great moments and possibilities within that. Just think, I think the, the biggest uh, threat right now in any kind of function is retail. We will live and we will work. The way we shop is under attack, you could say, or is in question, I think it's a better phrase. Not only because they're um, with digital means and, and um, the emergence of Amazon, but because shopping malls don't work anymore and they shouldn't because basically this uh, um, single function create scenarios that are not very complex and not very interesting. So think of maybe as, as, a, as a task, we do actually, we, we got called in the last weeks by three different developers that basically do retail, shopping malls um, and the likes that rethink all the business because they're all empty and they will be empty in the future. Now, what could you do if you do, if you think retail, but also work and living at the same time in these uh, in these mono functions. So, you know, third places are emerging, and we, we can deal with this in a way. To uh, to say it with Yoda, you know, you must unlearn what you have learned. We have to rethink, and we can rethink, and that's the beauty. Uh, it's it's our task. We're called to rethink functions and the ways um, cities are built today, um, and that is. The, the beauty. What we will see is the hybridization of spaces. Uh, we kind of like that. That's basically what graft uh, means. Grafting uh, is coming from making wine basically and, and bringing together two different properties, the root that it's resistant against the wine pest as we need that in Europe, otherwise we wouldn't have wine. Um, this cowboy root from America that is resistant against the parasite and then the old European sign that is placed on it only in the nation still have wine and we believe um it's it's a you know the parasite was american to start with introduced by french people in the 19th century we will see more and more cultural and and maybe natural clashes and we can't be afraid to question 
um, the functions or the methods we had before. We have to have hybridizations of ideas. Let's look at the workplace for a second. Um, you know, how does, you know, working used to look like and where is it today and where could it go? Let's play a little Lego game. Um, for working, we all know that you need talents. You need the young people. There is a, a global um, a search for young talents uh, and you have to organize the, the workspace so you get the best talents. Hence, this, this giant competition between the Facebooks and Googles that, that you know, invent entire cities so their employees, their talents are, are happy. Let's not forget that uh, there are also other people. Not everybody is young. How do you deal with, uh, you know, the older folks? We're in the interesting moment where we actually have, usually it's three or four generations that work together. We will have five generations soon because people are getting older and younger people are uh, going into the workforce. How do you mix them? Because in the, in the mixing, it's interesting. And then throw in data, artificial intelligence and technology. Hmm. What happens now? We see a possibility to great flexibility and freedom, meaning we can shift. We can work at home. We can work at night. We can work in third places. We can work in the car that is self-driving pretty soon. We can work um, in, in the train. So what does it mean for architecture? Does the architecture and the interior will have to change? Um, yes, probably yes. We probably need less work spaces. Uh, the desk will be reduced. We will have, though, more meeting spaces, or we need more, as the Googles do. We have to reintroduce living, meaning fun and, and uh, impulse, you know, so being excited also when you go to work. Um, it's basically the question for, for, for work that we have right now. If we look um, at these patterns, change is inevitable. Don't think that you are forever 18. You have to think the future, or otherwise the future will come to you, and it might not look uh, pretty. And I don't think that it stops there. The question is, uh, especially with digitization, um, where are we working tomorrow? And if we're working together, how does it look? 1950, we had basically uh, big companies. You started working there with the idea that you work there your whole life. In the 60s, uh, they were introducing big offices, right, where everybody was basically together. In the 70s, uh, 80s, it changed. Uh, all of a sudden, people wanted cubicles or they, they were forced into cubicles. So it's still a big office, but basically you are in a little box and, and do your thing. You don't really see the others. Um, in the 2000s, things started to change. People said, it's like, this is not working anymore. Or let's say um, there was the emergent of, of digital companies that uh, where, where the founders were younger than most of their employees, maybe, and they had different ideas of how to work together. Um, the co-working space, which uh, came into living in the, in the last 15 years, maybe, and the giant success of companies like WeWork, uh, included completely different things into our workspace. Like, yes, having a coffee, creating your own uh, food, maybe doing something at work that you otherwise wouldn't have done anyway. Having work, and you don't need to go out, uh, you bring it with you, or you have the coffee shop for somebody else. Um, what are you suggesting, right? What is the, if, if you do a big um, office building, what are you suggesting to the client saying, like, I don't even know who's going to rent my space in the future. What do you think? This here, for example, is a very, very successful office space. Well, it started as a cafe, but the owner was a, was a techie and he was a startup entrepreneur himself. So his friends were hanging out there. They were basically doing business out of his coffee. It's called Sankt Oberholz, um, has now... I don't know, a handful of new affiliates, and it's always this mixture of, yes, we're coffee, but basically they are um, a hotbed for young startup companies that work with a laptop on, on, their, um, on their legs, um, drinking good coffee, hopefully uh, with fair trade. And some of them really make it big. So they start to, um, to inherit the idea of working can look very different and maybe can be fun. Well, another radical question, what is, uh, we don't have to work anymore because automation, robots, um, other technologies basically doing the work. Nobody shows up anymore. Um, it's an office without people. Well, maybe it's the same office, but if we don't have to work that hard anymore, 
it might be good because finally we can be creative. Uh, but the question then is uh, being raised, who pays for us? Does robots have to be taxed or not? Um, interesting questions. Again, giant changes just in that field. And knowing that our cities will change because their space is becoming available because they're empty. Well, let's think about it. In a way, I mean, we are very excited about this because this is where um, architects, especially architects, with the ability to bring together connecting dots that others can't, um, you can come for, forward with solutions that nobody can think of. So we, we think we are in an exponential growth of change. And I think we are here, but we will go there. So creative people like architects that work though right in the epicenter of sustainability. And if you think of sustainability, if you look it up in Wikipedia, you will realize sustainability is based on three pillars. One is economy, the other is ecology, and the third one is culture. So name one profession that embraces all of these tri uh, three pillars better than architecture. I can't think of it. So there is a, a real burden on us in a way, but there's a great potential for us as well. Um, we can come up with new ideas and we should be bold because yes, reduction of death size will come and the same areas will look completely different and maybe not forever. Maybe this is, you know, an interior design for 10 years. You're already telling the client, you will rehire me. I give you a fee already in 10 years because we have to change it anyway. Let's do a, a frame contract for the next 20 years because you will need me anyway. What I'm saying is we see um, the dissolving of borders between functions like living and working um, or traveling. Um, we do work in, in different uh, places. So the this, this zones basically are the interesting parts. I show you a very, very old project, but in a way it's, uh, it's interesting. We did this project with containers. Um, back in the days where containers weren't even um, a building uh, material. In California, um, you could only use it in the interior because it was not uh, allowed to, to be used as an exterior um, uh, building material. We've done a lot of container building since, but uh, this is the first one. I think this is 15 years ago. The idea was to create a work environment that looks very interchangeable. We had a floor that uh, suggested that you do sports there, and and people did basically. Um, so, in a way, that, that was the time in in the first dot com bubble, where people were thinking, well. What if work is not just showing up and then going home and have fun? What is if work is fun? And I think, well, we all know that today, you actually, you have to think it in a way. You have to think living conditions because we work hard. So let's make it fun at the same time. And you won't secure talents if you're a big company, if you don't provide something that stimulates people. Back then, um, our clients ask us, well, we have young people, but they work 24 seven. They almost never leave the office. How uh, can we make it so they're still happy? Meaning, how can they still meet each other? Meaning, boy meets girl and vice versa. How How is food prepared and so forth? It was one of the first projects where we kind of uh, had the idea of changing things, maybe having conference rooms like this conference room that was basically, uh, you know, with a soft shell. It was uh, basically a nut cage. You know, these nuts, you know, you're, you're crazy. They put you in a nutcage where you can't hurt yourself. That was basically our idea for the meeting rooms. Um, you, you see this little thing here. If you're going too crazy, you get your medicine, whatever that might be. You can decide it yourselves. What we, we think, especially in the workspace, is there is now, we had the distinction between me areas to we areas. And there was a hybrid zone in between. There was That was small. Today, we have hybrid zones in all of these spaces. So the, the we is in the me and the me is in the we. Um, we can complain about it, that we're sitting at home right now working, or can say, oh, it's great. I actually think it's great. I mean, just imagine we couldn't do this if we wouldn't have the technology to do this. We probably would be bankrupt in a matter of weeks, but we can continue to work and it actually works well. 
it's tough also uh, raising kids and uh, teaching them. That <laughs> is really tough. Uh, you come to your limits um, working, you know, both parents. Uh, that's at least for me and my wife, who is an architect, and our kids, <laughs> that's not easy. But, you, you know, you grow with the challenges. But it's possible, and that's great. So let's, you know, define where we want to set limits. But first, let's enjoy this freedom that it's possible. What if trains are, I mean, they're already changing, are not only there, you can watch a movie, but you can actually not only work there, you could maybe work out. And also you, you do other functions, you bring functions together and you hybridize um, functions in our daily lives. I think Corona is just pushing us um, hard in the direction we were already tumbling towards too. Um, so that's interesting for us. We're working a lot in the mobility sector now. Uh, of course, we're German, we work with a lot of car companies. Um, but also, um, you know, monorails, basically rails that don't need a conductor anymore. And it's interesting, like airports function today in the spaces where you change your mode of transportation from a bike into a train or from a train into uh, an aeroplane. Uh, and yes, we will fly again. Um, it becomes interesting. We did um, for one study for Skyports for Volocopter. Volocopter is a pretty aggressive and successful new company, German company that uh, will cater to air transportation with drones uh, in the future. Now it becomes interesting if you go there and it's like a little, yeah, it's like a little uh, helicopter or train, uh, um, airplane. If you wait for your plane, it's like a taxi stand. What do you do while you wait for it? The same question, and we did our first uh, prototype in Singapore and opened it just before Corona crisis at the end of last year. Um, this is a rendering, but we actually did build it in the end. We also asked to develop a modular design for new stations, gas stations, um, but they're not with gas, but with uh, electricity. So the new infrastructure will look quite different. It's interesting um, to think about what will happen with these spaces, if a the car is absolutely clean, there is no gas, there is no danger of fire, it's just electricity. So in a way, you could also park the car inside the gas inside the station if you want to. And especially because it will take a little longer. It's not five minutes, maybe it's a 15 minute stay. What do you do with your 15 minutes, knowing that the gas station is like the water hole? Everybody has to come there. And we know that, that uh, stations today already are places where you shop, where there's retail, where you get your newspaper or maybe your morning bagels. Um, so if you have 50 minutes at your hand, it's a clean environment. That is an interesting new hybrid space. And the new thing is, of course, digitization, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality coming into reality right now. Um, and we're not saying that we don't like reality. We love reality. Um, I cannot tell you how, how happy we were as a family to be in Rome for one year. Um, I, we, we basically, we brought a lot of, I don't know even if you can see me, we brought a lot of travertine back <laughs> from, uh, from Rome. Um, here on the right side, when we're doing meetings, I think there's not, you know, it's great that you have the possibility to talk via um, Zoom and the likes, but there's nothing better to sit around one table um, and touch things and look into each other's eyes and hear somebody laugh or giggle um, at the joke you made and maybe understand something. It's um, On the right side, this is a, a space from Kengukuma where we had our last um, management meeting. Um, you see my partner Wolfram and Dennis in the back there. Uh, both of this is necessary, but it's great to have the freedom. So yes, we will see um, reality and virtual reality not only blend, but being overlapped completely, and they both have the rights. Um, this is uh, one of the shots that we did very early on. Um, I used to do, um, um, I am still doing um, Monday morning message, we call it, meaning the whole office comes together, it graphed Monday morning. And I basically tell them what's happening in the last week, what designs are out there, what competitions we're doing, what problems we're facing, what changes we want to do, um, and so forth. Of course, we can't do this anymore in the office, so now we're doing it in a digital way with over 100 people. It's fun. It actually works uh, well. But it definitely is more fun if you can look into people's eyes and they actually can ask things back or you actually see if 
you tell a little joke, you see a reaction, if it worked or not, or a reaction into a message, just gauging how people are. That uh, is something, um, empathy, digitalization means a lot of more freedom, but it lacks empathy sometimes. And uh, as I said before, we're lacking empathy between our nations uh, right now, and especially in Europe. Uh, I don't have to repeat myself. Uh, the Germans should just wake up and realize that uh, we have to be there for everybody if we can. And because we saved up some money, I think we do. Um, we should do it. Anyway, we're Europe and not nations. Um, and hopefully the borders will um, disappear again soon. Talking about uh, borders that disappear, of course, being in your home um, for so long, you know every single corner at one point. You know how you use it, what works, what not. You know the extent of your Wi-Fi. You know uh, who goes on your nerves. You know your favorite spot You know in the morning or maybe in the evening. Um, we all become uh, even better architects, I think in the way we understand the limitations of uh, architecture or um, partners that we live in right now. Um, and I want to dwell a little bit on, on the floor plan. You know, the, the praise of the floor plan by Le Corbusier, I think, is, uh, is even more valid today. The freedom an apartment can have or the, the unfreedom, you know, the, the boredom or unflexibility um, a floor plan can have. This here is an apartment, a penthouse that we built um, over 10 years ago in Berlin um, that was on top of an entire block, meaning it was to the street back to the courtyard, around the courtyard, so it was a big space. What we wanted though, we wanted a space that can be, that is very open, extremely open and can be used very flexibly. So what you see here are two terraces on both sides that you saw in the images, right? And the entire apartment opens up to, to these terraces. There's a courtyard in the middle. And around this courtyard, we creating, I hope you can see my cursor, uh, you, we created a figure that um, brings together all the wet zones, the functional zones, you know, the, the, the bathrooms and the kitchen, basically. And space is floating all around it. So your bedroom is part of the space. But if you want to, you can separate spaces, you just dissect spaces. So if you, if you look at these three diagrams, you see the big space basically going all around, even through the kitchen here. But if you want to, you single out uh, with walls that just um, pop out of the architecture, you single out certain areas, um, bedrooms, um, for example. Or you could even say it's like in the future, I don't, maybe I don't need my guest room uh, anymore. My son at that point is, is grown up and we can separate by bringing in a 300 euro um, wall in here. And then this uh, is a separate apartment. So basically you try to be flexible within the daily routine and maybe in years to come. Um, and we strongly believe in the flexibility of space within our apartments. This one is even smaller. And it uh, tries to be bigger than it actually is. So basically, you're looking uh, into a central block. It's a similar theme. You're looking into the private areas in the back here. So on this side, you see actually the, the bathtub. The kitchen is in the center and um, the toilet. Here is um, the, the bedroom. So, you know, this is the shot uh, within the kitchen. You have this block in the center. But then if you want to, with these, you know, simple measurements, you dissect the space into, um, into two different zones. So the apartment can look big if you want it to, or it can be separated if you needed it to be. Somebody goes to bed, the others want to party on. It's possible. Simple things, it, and you know, it looks simple. Actually, it's not that simple. It's always the best thing. If something looks simple, usually it's not. Um, but it's these ideas of flexibility, I think, that will come in more and more handy in the future. This project here, um, I'm very proud of. Uh, this is actually across the street from me, um, but it's in the end, and we built it for a very, very decent price, meaning our client could rent out apartments here for six euro 50 per square meter easily and still make a profit, meaning it is basically um, social living standard if you want to, but it is in Prenzlauer Berg, and of course uh, he can take more. He's taking 17. 
instead of 650. So anyway, we made somebody very, very rich and uh, I actually wanted to live there and couldn't afford it. What uh, was possible though is other people did rent there. I mean, I have a family, I need a bigger space. We did something, we did new and oh, this is an old hospital actually. Um, I want you to look at this new building here that has very small apartments. These apartments, they are all, as you can see here, um, every single frame is an apartment. Uh, so they're not big. And the smallest apartment is this one here. And we have a lot of them. This is basically a two room studio, but it's only 37.5 square meters big. It's tiny, but it works really well. Uh, we had, when we built it uh, six years ago, um, I could move in as I needed uh, at least three rooms for my kids and so forth. And that was getting expensive. But if you uh, use this tiny little studio, you pay, of course, less money. Even if the rent is 17 bucks per square meter with 37 uh, square meters, you can imagine it's not expensive. We actually had um, a Syrian refugee in the office who was doing our IT and he lived there because he could afford it because it was so small, but it did work. Now, if you do this, of course, you need amenity spaces. So this whole thing has a community, has a club uh, uh, building and a club room, basically, where people come together and work together. Again, the same thing of living and working and has a, um, a kindergarten and, and a shopping mall. So again, using flexibility within our spaces, within apartments, I think, is uh, has been uh, the calling before, but even more will be uh, tomorrow. We have to be intelligent about the way we use our floor plans and maybe buildings um, so they, they can adapt to a change, right? This here is also um, a project, this is for Namibia, where the necessity, like anywhere in Africa, the necessities are even harder, what you do. What we try to do here is come up with an idea so somebody that almost have no money, lives in a hut, could afford a very, very cheap building. Uh, the biggest problems in the world uh, is being bankable. If you're not bankable, meaning if you don't get a credit, you cannot uh, grow. And that uh, counts for nations, as we all know, and as Italy knows really well, and that's why we need to help uh, and should be generous about it. If you're not bankable, you're basically on a spiral to uh, down, or you can't get up. That's why a lot of Africa is basically individuals cannot really grow. They're not bankable. Why not? Because they don't even have an address. If you have an address, if you have a simple shed maybe with an address, you become bankable. So real estate really is the key to, um, to progress, to, um, to growth, personal growth. So we try to invent um, a living quarter that is based on a single unit. The smallest possible house you can think is just this unit. And maybe it has two floors. But basically, it has a staircase. Yes, if you want a second floor. It has a kitchen. It has a bathroom. And you could squeeze in a couch. That is the, 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 the most simple cabana you could think of. And you could live in it. Now, you could extend upwards. And you can stand, extend to the side. So from this little house, once you are bankable and you do a little business, you can grow. You can grow with a family and you can grow your business. So basically from this simple module box, you can grow with your house if, and that's possible, this was a project for Namibia. So, so real estate is not the problem. It's not really the land. It's how the land is dissected and what products are provided. And nobody uh, really uh, thinks of the people that have nothing. So with a simple box, you become bankable and you can grow actually. That is another idea maybe to go forward, maybe also in Europe, as I fundamentally believe that where you design with the sheer need and the necessity, you have to be lean about your thoughts. And these things will come back to us in crisis. And this is where we are right now. Um, so yes, this is possible. I don't think it looks bad. Um, so again, from me to we and creating hybrid zones. Uh, the last project in, the, in that that I want to show you is this five tower construction that is created as living and working, meaning you should, it's kind of a startup cluster. You're supposed to work there on your ideas, but you can live there as well. 
no one's asking questions as long as you go forward with your idea. This is in the heart of Berlin. It's very, very dense and it's all based on community, meaning the towers are cheaper because in the towers we don't have showers. We don't have um, washing machines uh, and you don't really cook there because these are all communal ideas. And if it is living, you know, almost like student living, little, you know, think of a monastery almost in a way. So you have the cores that are necessary, of course. And yes, maybe you have the shower there, you need toilets at least. But the cooking and everything else is somewhere else. And then, you know, you could also use it as working areas. And maybe this is alternating in floors or in the towers itself. We basically said that is up to the people that live there. If they live there or they work there, they just have to create, they have to grow. The idea of coming together is in the in the basement on the first floor and on the ground floor. Big market spaces. This is where you cook together, uh, where you eat together, where you do your washing together. And you do this in a system of circular economies, meaning if you have the top uh, in growing your vegetable um, and you have maybe aquaponic systems, meaning your fish tanks in the basement. Um, so you, you can use um, your bio waste um, for the fish and then the fish poop basically to harvest, uh, to, to, um, to uh, have the right uh, uh, ingredient for, for uh, growing plants. You get circular economies. And uh, yeah, that's something that we're, we're developing in Berlin. And it was uh, highly controversial, but everybody loved it until the government here in Berlin changed. And all of a sudden, uh, this all has to be student living and it cannot be complex anymore. I fundamentally believe that these are the ideas of tomorrow, where living and working are not two functions that have to be separated, but they embrace each other. Um, I think there needs to be new systems in our zoning. But yes, we have to convince the authorities to do this. Um, Coming to the third thing, um, basically this is about healing architecture, but uh, based on data uh, and science, so to say. Um, we did one project uh, with together with the Charité. If you're not familiar with uh, Germany and Berlin, the Charité is uh, a giant hospital complex. It's the oldest one in Berlin, hence the French name. Um, you know, Germany was very French uh, in, in the uh, Illuminati times. You know, we had a king here, the, the, the great uh, Fritz, uh, who, who loved Voltaire and uh, conversed with him. Um, uh, he was a great man, actually. He was also a big um, um, fighter. He, he fought many wars anyway, but he is kind of the start of the Prussian uh, rise anyway. But it started with good ideas. The Charité is still there and they are right now on the upfront of the coronavirus, meaning most of the virologists and epidemiologists that, that um, uh, are consultants to the government are in that hospital. Um, we like them very much. They're around the corner from our office. We, and we asked them if we should, should not do a project. This is four years ago. Um, we wanted to do a project that basically would, would prove that environment or let's say architecture can heal and i think everybody every architect would say it's like well yeah that's a given but it never has been proven really right bertolt brecht said an apartment can kill you yes he is right what about an apartment that could heal you and in order to prove it we applied for money and we got it and with the charity we built four icus intensive care units these units are the places where people now are fighting death right now with the coronavirus in their lungs and their bodies. Um, and we did with, with, with um, basically saying, if you have an ICU that looks like this and that sounds like this, uh, yeah, no, no, no wonder that in, in your delir, you're in stress, you're in pain, you cannot heal. What if we try to um, be much more clean about it to control the sounds and control basically your visuals? And we created a, a giant baldachin above the beds that changes. It changes actually when you're sleeping and you're stressed, it changes because it's um, responding to your vital body uh, fluids. So if you're sweating, if your heart pressure goes up, it changes mode, it comes slower. Because in the delir, you're not sleeping, but you're not awake either. You actually see things without noticing it. 
Um, this is a, a little movie that shows a little bit how this is working basically. Um, so even when you're awake, meaning you're not in the delir anymore, you're healing, uh, what can be done is that you control the environment yourself. So in a way we can control uh, day cycles, but once the process is a little bit further on the way, um, the patient basically can do control of these things themselves, meaning they can calm it down, they can um, guide things, whatever doctors can actually see the cognitive uh, um, a status of the patient. Anyway, um, we have done this project for two years um, and the Charité has done the scientific um, proof, basically. It's a big, um, very big uh, book that came out a couple of months ago. And they did prove that, yes, architecture or environment can heal you, meaning the process of healing here in our intensive care units is 30% faster than any other ICU. And that is, uh, I think that's wonderful. We were so proud to prove that architects, yes, we are healers, or we can be, we also can be the opposite. So think about your responsibility. Another project where it's all about healing, especially the lungs, is um, a project we haven't published because uh, we're not allowed to do it, but I'll show it briefly here. This is um, a center in Ethiopia where there is no kids um, hospital at all. And this is a hospital for kids that have tuberculosis. And especially in the combination with AIDS, it's, it's, uh, it's lethal. People, you know, kids die, uh, and a lot of them. So we try to come up with a design that would separate different um, status of tuberculosis, meaning if you're really infected, you have to stay within your vicinity. So there are different um, um, circles defined by the heaviness of your, your illness. At the same time, it gives a sense of, of being protected. And what we wanted to do, and that is something I think we will see much more. It already started years ago, but we see it more and more. In times where you don't have access to material coming from overseas, from China, whatever, you go back basically to what you have on your front porch, the material we all know, if it's wood, or clay. Here it was bamboo, not really used in Ethiopia, but it's there. They just didn't know how to use it. And of course it's clay. So it's 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 craftsmanship, it's it's manufacturing thing you know, with your hand, mano. Um, it, it, we, we basically um, taught people how to create uh, bamboo sticks as a material, as a building material, and how to do um, clay uh, uh, modules, bricks, basically, um, to build this up. So basically all the, the construction methods, all the material came right from the site. This, of course, is not something, um, you know, if you compare it to Namibia, in Namibia we try to do something that goes fast and that can go anywhere. And yes, it is not very sustainable in terms of material because you need concrete. Otherwise, you cannot be systemic. If you do this with clay, you will never see the day. It's just impossible to do to be systemic with it because it takes much time. You need uh, to clone yourself a million times to do this. But here we wanted to do this right. So it is clay and it is bamboo. Um, and the people learned, basically, you, you're creating resilience also because you tell people how to create a business, how to, to uh, come up with, uh, with construction material. Um, and these are the rafters, basically the blue is for the roof and the clay is for the walls. Uh, and we did this for a couple of years. It's incredibly hard work and it takes forever, but it's uh, it's cheap and it, and it makes sense because you do it with the people. Um, the project got into other problems. Uh, fire codes changed all the time. All of a sudden the roof had to be different, but I, I don't want to bore you with it. I fundamentally believe um, that this way of thinking is definitely one way forward, uh, not only in Africa, but uh, also, of course, in Germany. Hence, working, of course, with, with clay and mud uh, and bricks and maybe um, uh, um, wood, of course, is, is essential for us going, going forward. Um, we had done an article some times ago, which we called Neo Biedermeier. If you know, don't know the Biedermeier, it's a certain style in Germany um, 
that is very clean and puristic design from the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, Biedermeier basically is also, that's the time when in Germany the Kammer music, Kammer meaning chamber, Kamera, no? um, where Schubert and, and uh, the likes um, did a lot of music for people being at home. Why were they at home? Because the French troops with Napoleon had conquered all of Europe, the same in Italy. In Germany, it um, basically, uh, it, it, it forced people to stay at home and to make do what was available to yourself. So they, they looked into their own homes. They did music together. That's why Kammer music uh, was, even today, is, is from that time, really, because they um, developed it. And everything that was built at that time um, was, of course, the wood and the construction material of that time. I think we will see another Biedermeier era um, coming after the corona crisis. I don't think that globalization is over. And I don't think that would be the right thing. I'm just saying it will be a big part of being smart about what you use uh, when it is at your fingertips. Um, of course, I'm preaching to the choir here as Rome is the city that did this for 4,000 years? <laughs> A lot of years, let's say. Now 3,000. Okay, um, I'm just saying, um, I think this is interesting. Um, as uh, it forces us to to look inside and work with the things that uh, that we have right now, as we basically are forced back um, into our vicinities. Um, I true, truly believe, though, both is valid, right? To work with what you have, but also um, I believe, and we have to work together globally as well. Um, one thing, and that is the last project I'm talking about today, and I don't know, some of you might have seen a lecture that I gave at uh, Roma 3. Um, this is something that is about energy and actually trying to do something that is local, but basically we did it um, uh, and, and tried to help people there. Uh, not to tell them what to do, but to, to help, help themselves basically. The idea is simple. This is the world at night. Where you see light, you have access to energy. Where there's no light, there's no access to energy. It doesn't mean that there are no people. There are a lot of people in Southern America, in uh, Southeast Asia, but especially also in Africa. A lot of people, but no access to energy. And if you follow me in saying without energy, no development, just as much as no access to financing, you know, being bankable, no development, uh, no wonder that Africa can't go forward. Why is it that way? Because it's just too expensive to build the roads and the energy lines to the people that are in rural off-grid Africa. So basically, you have to think about energy in a different way because there's an abundance of energy um, that you have to bring to people. We're not talking about uh, you know small amount of people. We're talking about 16, probably 20% of the world's population. Right, and if these people don't see a possibility to grow, they will pack their things and go north. So um, we rather help. You know, it's it's uh, it's it's mandatory. You can see it as a problem or as an opportunity, um, because these people need energy and they have energy. They're they're, they're cooking um, with wood, so deforestation is a giant problem. They're buying kerosene for obscene prices. They spend so much money on energy, much more than any of us. Not in comparison, in true numbers. So that's obscene. But it's also a lot of money. We're talking about $30 billion a year in off-grid uh, areas. And there is an energy source, and that's the sun. And the sun is shining where it's most needed. So at the moment where photovoltaic became available, you can think of new energy slash business ideas. Energy can become a currency. Not only a current, but a currency. And there you have it. We call it the solar kiosk. It's a graft energy hub. We designed a little kiosk that um, has photovoltaic panels on the top, uh, so it has an abundance of energy and you can do business with it. What you see there is a man that has light and the light will always be on. We have a fridge so we can cool medicine or drinks or any other things. And we sell energy in charging phones, in uh, giving light to other people, under other entrepreneurs. Um, so around... The energy, it's very much like the Eon gas station I showed before. People will go there because this is where they get everything, and this is running 
because you're you're autonomous with that energy. Um, what it really does, you see, when I change to the next slide, you see it because it's always on at night and people will flock to it. And we have basically started a company that's our slogan, Enable Empower, the solar, solar kiosk company. Um, and we have developed um, a thing, a part of kids that can go anywhere that is not on grid. On grid would be a container, but we are off grid. So this has to go even by donkey sometimes has to go to places where the car can't go. But when, once it's there, it has to be sturdy. It has to be easy to be erected. And once it's there, it will deliver something. It will change the environment. It will become the heart of a village and uh, create jobs. And this is the main thing. With these energies, you can sell things. You can sell energy, energy products, meaning you can buy a lamp with a solar panel, small one and a battery, and you don't have to buy candles anymore. And that uh, money after two months, uh, you know, it paid for its investment. It's money in your pocket that you can use for other things. Um, so um, this is basically, this is, uh, we did 200 sites um, in Africa. We don't put them there and sell them. We operated them, meaning we started companies in each African sub-Saharan country and did run it with them. And the business case was that the, the kiosk itself is profitable. It creates jobs. People make money with the things they're selling, the energy they're selling, and we share this profit and then build the next kiosk. This is Rwanda. This is uh, President Kagame and the CEO of uh, Coca-Cola. We did this project with them because, yes, it's not easy to do it and it's expensive, so you need big partners. And this is Jesse Jackson, who was there as well. Um, so, yeah, this is a, a bigger site where we give energy to other people, barbers, um, there are food stalls, we have um, uh, even cinemas where they show movies and charge for it. So um, that is something that we did in these countries where um, had been uh, raising these kiosks. We did over 200 of them till I realized as I was acting CTO, the chief technology officer of the company, that it's good to have um, this as a business hub. What about schools? What about clinics? So the next thing I did is create this uh, from our module, our modular system that can grow in space and in energy to create assembly halls, schools, and clinics. And this is the education hub that we um, put into Al Zatari. Al Zatari is the biggest refugee camp in, in Jordan. Um, and this is basically a school that des now has energy, can charge lamps so that they can uh, teach longer. They can teach um, double of the people because they don't have to shut down when the sun goes down and they have access to information. And that is uh, almost key. We then um, grew into designing a health hub. As you can see, it's always the same idea of the system. And this is um, a two unit thing that does blood testing, urine testing um, and mother child care. Meaning um, if you're with child, you have ultrasound and uh, we put this also into um, Jordan with the Siemens Stiftung, and we put five of these uh, in Kutupalong in Bangladesh. This is the biggest refugee camp in the world. Um, uh, and yeah, the next thing will be to have this as uh, testing stations for Corona in Africa, and we negotiations for that. Um, yeah, this is Al Zatari. No, this is actually it's wrong. This is Al Mafrak. Um, this is not in the in the camp, this is in the country, because most of the refugees actually in Jordan are in the country, not in the camp. Um, and these all help us there. Um, anyway, next big thing that I think is also necessary is energy education and then mobility. So what if you are the gas station for a drone that delivers vaccines to places that are hard to reach and so forth? Anyway, um, as I said, if you think the change and you think the possibilities architects can think in terms of energy, infrastructure, space, you can create things that maybe other people don't think about. Uh, this we, just before everything was shut down, I was in Kigali in Rwanda. That was the first um, drone uh, summit in Africa and drone delivery is a very big thing, um, I think in the future because it's, it's green and it's fast and yeah, you need to bring things to people. Um, okay, if you bear with me, I said the last project, this is very, I think really the last. Health has to come to our homes as well. These are a double house and a villa on the outskirts of Berlin. 
Um, we believe in densification. We believe in being smart about being urban. And as I said, even our flower plants, every centimeter counts. So if you take the commission to do a villa on the outskirts that is just eating up land, you better have a good um, answer to do this. And for us, the answer uh, was when we took on the commission, we will only do it if you allow us to, um, to be energy sensible and to uh, tackle the problem of mobility because there is no bus. You have to have a car in order to go places. So we try to do something that is healthy and smart um, and basically created villas that are built completely out of wood and clay. So it's, it's wood construction, wood cladding, mineral insulation and clay walls inside and clay plaster that um, the great thing about clay, that's why we use it also in Ethiopia, is that it um, it stores moisture, humidity, and gives it back not only heat uh, or cold, if you like, but also moisture. It creates a very, very clean and healthy climate for your home. Um, but the key was that the house was gaining more energy than it actually uses itself. It's autonomous with its um, uh, energy demand and its heating demand, but it has an excess of energy that then can full, uh, fuel um, an e-vehicle. So you basically, you rent the space with the car. It comes with the house, you drive for free. And that was uh, important for us. And yet still, of course, it is um, a very generous um, house that connects the inside with the outside. You see the clay uh, interior here with a fireplace that warms up the clay and above the staircase. Um, and yeah, I wish I would live in a house like that because uh, it is incredibly healthy. So healthy conditions um, based on facts basically is something um, that architects can contribute into the future of our houses, our apartments and our cities. Um, in order to do this, I think we all have to really think outside the box, sounds cheesy, but it is true. Um, we all need, if possible, a little getaway and a healthy house. This is our little healthy house. This is me and Wolfram and my family. This is our little dacha. Um, it's, it's basically one room where we um, get to on the weekends. It was so ugly that we decided to put a mirror in front of it so you don't see it. Um, and we basically said, okay, let's put in a motto that reminds us of how we want to act in this world. So you see this little um, sign here. It says, stay, hung stay hungry, stay foolish. And this is, of course, borrowed from Steve Jobs, who um, basically used this in his famous commencement speech at Stanford University in 2005 before he died. If you're interested, you should look it up. It's a great speech. And he said, stay hungry, stay foolish. But he borrowed it as well. He borrowed it from the whole Earth catalog. Um, the last one came out in 74, and this is the back side of it. Um, and again, as we have to think the whole earth, especially today, I want to close today with exactly this back side of the whole earth catalog. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Thank you, guys. I'm going to log out now. I hope it wasn't too long, um, and uh, thanks for listening. Grazie mille, Lars. Eh, ci hai dato un, un sacco di spunti di riflessione, molte cose interessanti, hai fatto vedere delle belle immagini, oltre che dei bei progetti. E, ti, immagino che tu sia stanco, perché non è facile parlare così a lungo, praticamente da soli davanti al computer. È meglio farlo in inglese, in italiano non <ride> potrei farlo. Ma okay. se, se ci sono domande, sì. Ecco, eh. se hai pazienza, altri pochi minuti, eh, faccio fare tre, tre domande di numero. Tre studenti. La prima è Lavinia Antonelli. Lui Eccomi. chiedo di prendere la parola, farsi vedere e fare la domanda. Buon pomeriggio. E posso fare la domanda in italiano? Sì, se non, se non lo fai eh, troppo velocemente posso Va bene, sì. Va bene. E una curiosità, volevo chiederle, quando si trova a contatto con una nuova area di progetto per la prima volta, e da, cosa, da cosa si lascia influenzare? 
principalmente. Ok. Uh, difficile perché dipende dal, dal progetto, mm. perché i progetti possono essere così diversi, ma secondo me la, la prima cosa che facciamo noi um, sempre è uh, fare questioni, do, domande, domande, tante domande, non, non ci sono domande stupide, mai. Così um, penso che se, se, uh, per un progetto um, c'è la responsabilità di, di, di dare un, una risposta giusta. E qualche volta uh, progetti da clienti uh, vengono con, con, un, um, con una regola o forse un problema uh, che sembra fissa. E secondo me si, si deve sempre chiedere se questo problema o questa domanda è la domanda giusta. Così, secondo me, um, come un architetto deve chiedersi e altri fare un discorso all'inizio di, um, di provare di, di sì, trovare la domanda giusta per avere la risposta giusta. Secondo me ci sono tantissimi pro progetti che non chiedono um, le domande giuste. Così, questo è, è, è come, come fare un... Um, eh, fare un sbaglio di, di uh, come si dice, di, um, di avere un, uh, una, una ra arraccia, no? If, if you have an arrow and a bow and you're shooting, right? Se, se tu non hai la domanda giusta, uh, la, la tua, non è possibile di avere il, uh, the arrow, arriccia? No. Um, in the target. Allora, si deve essere attento um, della, della direzione uh, del, um, del, del, del progetto, perché altrimenti sarà un, una, una risposta a un'altra domanda che non è così importante. Si deve chiedere sempre, e lungo, parlare con, con il cliente, parlare con il cliente. Sì, è interessante questo che... Siccome il progetto è una risposta a un'esigenza, devi capire qual è l'esigenza del committente per dare la risposta giusta e quindi devi fare delle domande. Penso, io penso che um, in tedesco, eh, sai, eh, Adolfo, um, c'è una parola che, che vuole dire außergewöhnlich, fuori del, 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 um, comune. del comune, ma gewöhnlich in tedesco vuol dire anche wohnen che vuol dire um, vivere, abitare, abitare. Sì. così noi siamo le persone che possono, noi siamo esperti, no? Così uh -huh. uh, io non penso che i clienti hanno le, le risposte o le domande giuste, dobbiamo veramente, noi siamo quest, questo bouncing board, allora un, uh, dobbiamo essere il think tank uh, per... Um, evaluare le, le domande perché il cliente non è il suo professione no? certo. eh, siamo tutti uh, professionalisti perché tutti noi abitiamo no? ma uh, abitare e abitare sono, sono due cose noi possiamo pensare il, il eccezionale grazie Bene, grazie, Aurora mille. Casa... grazie Antonelli Aurora Casasola Please, please ask the question in English. Oh, okay, I will Thank try. You. <laughs> um, so we uh, talk about um, how uh, the uh, society uh, can be like a um, start point uh, to uh, make a project. And uh, um, Uh, right now, we are living in a moment that uh, will probably uh, changing in a um, heavy way uh, this uh, society that we are living until now. So, um, my question is, uh, um, in your opinion, how can uh, a project like uh, uh, be the answer of the future society that we are, we are living with, with, 
that we will live uh, after this crisis of coronavirus. Um, I'm not 100% sure if I um, got it right, but I think what you said is um, how can we how can we bring forward a project if we don't have a client, but the whole society is our client? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I believe that it's actually a necessity in a way. Uh, it's hard. It's hard for a young architect um, to break through because if you don't have a lot of money and you don't know a lot of people with money, architecture is a very costly profession. So it's, it's really hard to get your first commission. It really is. Um, that's why when we started, uh, it was good to have collaborators. And we did this for a while. Basically, we made ourselves look stronger because, because we had friends in, uh, we started in LA, we had friends in, in Germany, friends in China, and we basically said, oh, let, let's do a collaborative. So we look better, we share our portfolios, so we look better. And, and this works well. A lot of people did this, and I think this is still something you can do today. That answers your question only halfway. I believe, though, if you, if you think you have an answer to a problem uh, in society, you should sketch it and then start communicating it. Um, we live in times that are actually quite interesting, I think. I think this is possible. I think for the first time, actually, architects with great ideas can come forward and make a name for themselves. Um, I give you a comparison. Um, Piranesi was not really a famous man, uh, at least not in Europe. He might have been uh, famous in Rome, but not all over Europe. He used a mode of communication, which, which was his printing. He did his great visions of Rome and of antiquity, a new architecture that he invented that never existed and did great drawings with them, but stamps, basically his drawings hence flooded the European market and he became famous, very famous all over Europe. We have a, a, a similar but even better and much more potential um, possibility with digitization today. If you have a great idea, you have means of communication on social media. Um, I think that you can use Instagram just as much as the printing was used by Peronesi today. Uh, one of our best um, designers that I had uh, the honor to work with in China. He was an employee, he was still a student, but graduated afterwards. He was from Austria. And we tried to uh, convince him to stay with us, but he said, no, I will try to make it on, on my own. And it was hard for him. Uh, he had a partner in China, but he went back to Austria. And basically he didn't build much, but he he had a way to communicate his projects through Instagram. And by now he has a giant following, giant. I, I think it's 500,000 or something. Uh, you, you should look it up. Chris Precht is his name, Precht. Okay. Um, he's a great guy and he's getting more and more commissions. Um, I'm just saying, if you have an idea, there That's are not. means to communicate this and uh, you, you can you can create your own um, projects. Um, I, I strongly encourage you to actually do this. Uh, you can buy a piece of land with some friends. Yes, you need some money and start building or projecting and then selling. This is something that happened here in Berlin a lot where people had great ideas. They commissioned um, um, a property, did a design, they didn't build it yet, they didn't have money and they sold it off um, the paper, so to say, and then build it. So you can become your own client if you if you want to. There are ways to do this. The the main thing is to have to ask the right questions and have good answers, and good ideas will come through. Okay, thank you. Grazie, grazie mille, casa sola, grazie mille, Lars. Ultima domanda, Francesca Limongelli. Hi. Hi. Hi, Francesca. Hi. Um. So I have two uh, very fast questions. <laughs> um, the first one uh, is uh, regarding the, the role of tomorrow's architects. And in the meaning that um, are you, you said that architects should be uh, healers, should be artists, should be 
educators and should be artists as well. Um, so I was thinking um, for tomorrow's society where um, we need to educate another time people to live their the life in the city. Um, is the architect one of those actors that should um, educate in a new way to live the city? And my second question is, um, we all say that during this quarantine we have more time, um, free time, and I was wondering if you uh, catched up to some hobbies, new hobbies or past hobbies that you <laughs> didn't have time to catch up to or something like this. Okay. Um, the first question, um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure if I, if I got it, but I need, need to say, I mean, we don't have to be, I'm saying we can. Based yeah. on, on our education, um, there's a lot of dots that we can connect. I, I, I think we see um, possibilities where others see problems. Um, and that I think should encourage us to, to think about solutions. Um, the other thing is, we don't have to do it ourselves. When we started a project like Solar Kiosk um, or other projects, uh, like the ICU thing, you should always pick the best partners. You don't have to do it by yourself. Architects, I'm not saying architects know everything. No, we don't. But we may be the last of the generalists that live um, <laughs> in, in professions, right? So um, if you have an idea, partner up with people that are strong and that have an expertise you don't have and that complement you. That's one thing. The other thing is, I'm also not saying that we all should live in cities. Uh, I actually think this is a possibility to, to rethink the idea of, do we really have to live in cities or can we rediscover the countryside um, and, and work from there? For there, maybe, but also from there. Um, in a way, I, I think this is something that uh, Italians understand much more than, than other nations. I think um, from Roman times even till today, most of Italians I know um, have this, this fundamental idea of um, La Città, the, 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 the urban center, but also um, the life in the countryside. Um, most people have a garden or a house or grandma with a house, so um, much more than, than Germans, by the way, or, or, um, or English people, I think, or, or Dutch. So to rethink, you can live in both sides, especially with digitization we have today. Uh, maybe there is now the possibility beside, this is not in um, uh, this or that, it's in, it's an either or, like both is necessary. You can um, re-jumpstart small cities. That's the beauty about Italy though. There's almost no village. If you talk about a village in Germany, it really is a village. If you talk about a village in, in, in Italy, it usually is a small city, right? Even if it's very small, it's built out of stone as a market uh, a square, a town home. Anyway, uh, for me, Italy is, and I think it was a beautiful work by uh, Cucinella, um, the, the archipelago that he was talking about at the Biennale, um, that yes, Italy is, is not necessarily big cities, except Milan and, and Rome and Naples. Um, it's a lot of small cities. So it, there is this blend of uh, civitas, of society in cities and uh, small cities already. I'm saying um, we don't have to all like go in the cities. We should go where there is a potential. And I think uh, in, in the big cities there is a lot. Rome is special in a way, but it has also its industrial zones and uh, maybe shopping malls uh, that don't work anymore. Um, but especially in Milan or um, other bigger cities that are more like uh, Northern Europe, they're facing huge problems, I think. That's, that's what I'm saying, that the potential um, in our um, developed cities that now suffer because the topologies don't work anymore. Um, I don't know, did that answer your question? I'm not so sure if I answered yeah. your first one, yeah? Yes, you did, thank you. So, in a way, thanks for the questions. In a way, I think what I would like to leave you with is a sense of hope in times where hope is scarce and it's it's a tough, really a tough uh, world. But I'm, I'm absolutely certain that we will overcome this. And then there's more to do for architects than ever before. 
And I fundamentally believe, and I hope you got this, uh, yes, we are the right people to help. It will be, uh, it will be very interesting, I think, um, the future. There, there was hardship, but there are always potentials. And uh, we should be the first ones to see it. Yes. And act on it. Okay. Lars, intanto grazie Limongelli. Grazie a lei. Grazie mille Lars. Thank you so much for your positive messages and for your valuable contribution. You have in Roma 3 a lot of friends. Thank that you. Lo that love you. <laughs> and uh, we can't wait to see you in, in Italy, in Rome. Again. Yeah. Anch'io. Anch'io. Also. Sono molto contento, ti ringrazio tantissimo Lars, è stato un grande piacere come sempre. Grazie tanto, allora, a ciao presto. a tutti. Ciao, a grazie, ciao. ciao. Grazie a tutti ragazzi, ci vediamo mercoledì prossimo. Arrivederci. 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 Grazie, salve. Ciao. Arrivederci. Ciao. Arrivederci. 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 Grazie, arrivederci. Grazie, arrivederci.